FPGA field, actively involved on the publishing and conference committees. Uh, he works at Intel Altera um, and particularly is uh, focused on the arithmetic circuitry in the Intel FPGAs. He's the architect of the, for example, the DSP units that can floating point capable DSP units that in the ARIA 10 and Stratix 10. He's a U of T alumni as well. Um, he actually works at Intel in the UK. Um, so yeah, so thanks a lot for joining us today and look forward to your talk, Mark. All right, well thanks for uh, inviting me, Jason, and thanks to everybody for attending. And why am I saying thanks? Because you're the first ones to be the guinea pigs for my new presentation, which is trying to, uh, part of this isn't just about acceleration, it's about trying to uh, introduce a new way of looking at power. And this is a uh, power that you can feel and touch, not just not some uh, number that you see on a data sheet which I think is part of it. So dark silicon is silicon we can't use because of power density. Uh, and this was foretold uh, many years ago. Uh, you can use some of the silicon all the time, uh, all of the silicon some of the time, but you can't use it all of it all of the time. And this is what we're running into with a lot of the technologies right now when we're building these reticle buster dies, especially as you'll see in a little bit here, the way that the power scaling is done, doing. One thing I'm going to talk about is not only might we be unable to run all the um, part at the same time, but what if we could look at an FPGA where we didn't have to run all the part all of the time? And I'm going to show you some places where we can use some of the traditional features of the FPGA to, in a way that they don't have to be used. In other words, they can just support the uh, features that we want to use for a particular application. And we're going to use sustained peak ratio um, because things like uh, matrix multiply works really well for GPU or CPU or any of these um, FPGA. These are re very regular things. But if we're using irregular algorithms, things like matrix compositions, these generally don't work well. So as part of this, what we're going to do is look at algorithmic efficiency, then look at architectural efficiency using as little of the um, device as possible. Uh, and always keeping in mind that power is a real thing. And I think that all of us uh, probably take powers, uh, power for granted. We walk into a room, we flick the light switch, we don't actually realize the real cost of that. And that's part of the things that I want to introduce here. So power, and I'm going to try to keep this very, very simple. Using the, uh, as a template, the elementary engineering textbook, the cat and the Hadamard transform. Um, I'm going to do this all via pictures. And about 10 years ago, I saw this type of slide for the first time, and I thought, wow, this is a fantastic slide. It's got nuclear reactors, rockets, nuclear fusion. I mean, it's got everything. You know, this is the greatest slide in the world. One day when I grow up, I'm going to be able to use this slide in a talk, too. And as I started developing this talk, I thought, okay, well, uh, dark silicon, I can use this slide. I can finally use this slide. And as I started using the slide and writing supporting material for it, I realized this is completely irrelevant. Who here has stuck their hand inside a nuclear reactor? Right? This is just, you know, we've got to find a better way to think about uh, power scaling and then power as well. So let's have a look at something that where there's both a power problem and a power scaling problem. And we look at the die shot of a modern GPU. Uh, this is something currently in production, the 16 nanometer FinPET, which is a production process. It's got 10 teraflops, the same as a modern FPGA. It's not a reticle buster because we're running into the power wall, or I'm assuming uh, they're running into the power wall because it's 300 watts, according to the, um, the people who analyzed this at the bottom. Uh, and that's all we're going to be able to, we're not going to be able to take more than 300 watts out of this. Uh, area. So 300 watts, and you think, oh, well, that's just three light bulbs. I mean, most of us now, we're mostly using LED light bulbs at home, but uh, all of us grew up where we flicked the switch and there was a 100 watt light bulb. That's just, you know, flick the switch, you don't think about it. But 300 watts is a lot of power because if we look at, rather than this dimensionless 300 watts, if you think about something that you can actually feel and touch, a horse is 750 watts. So if you think about it, that's two GPUs or two GPU cards. 
you know, that, the horse is a pretty big, warm, smelly thing. You know, you, you, you know when you're around a horse. Now, actually, this horse is probably generating a lot more than one horsepower right there. And this is, I told Jason we would have this as a, it's a good um, thing for a problem set in first year inside physics. This horse and rider probably weigh about 650 kilos together. They're traveling at 400 meters per minute, and they're about to jump a meter 50 fence. What's the actual output of this horse? It's probably a lot more than one horsepower. But again, if we think about wattage, you know, the things that our modern FPGAs use, it doesn't take a lot of chips to make up a horse. Now, on things that we probably use more every day, if you think about a standard small family car, this is only going to be about 25 GPU cards going at 60 miles an hour down the 401. And, you know, so you just think about 25 GPU cards, you know, that's moving this big lump of metal and various other composite materials now. And if you're standing in the middle of 401 and that's coming at you, that's not 20, you're not thinking about, oh, that's only 25 GPU cards. That's a lot of power. Uh, if you want to do the math, the, um, it said that a modern car can travel at that uh, steady state at about, using about 10 horsepower. It's actually a bit more if you, if you work it out. It's probably about close to 15 horsepower. But that's not going to be too far off uh, 25 GPU cards. It gets worse because if you tell your friends that you're going to drive from Toronto to Ottawa, and they say, oh, that's an incredible waste of energy. But if you tell them that you're mining Ethereum in your bedroom, and you've got your six rack uh, GPU set up there, which you can buy right off Amazon, uh, with the drivers and everything, just plug and play. If you run that for 24 hours, that's almost going to give you enough power to drive your small car from to Toronto to Ottawa. That's a lot of power, and it's something we don't think about the cost of using cryptocurrency, for example. Now, just to make sure my numbers were approximately correct, I sent the uh, slide deck to a friend of mine, somebody who's actually in this room, who judgment I trust a lot. Uh, he's very good at math, and I said, just double check the numbers for me. And obviously he's probably got this, uh, he knows what he wants to buy, and he says, hey, those numbers can't be right. My dream car, 800 horsepower, dream car, the battery that weighs the better part of a ton, uses more electricity than that. But actually not that much more than that. Um, according to the Tesla website, you can work out that this will go about four miles on one kilowatt, uh, kilowatt hour, uh, which means that you're going to need about 15 kilowatt hours to go 60 miles which is about 20 horsepower. So it's going to use about 20 horsepower, this big, expensive luxury car, to go with steady state. So it's not a huge number of GPU cards that we're using. So it's really important for us to think about power is a real measure that we've got to think about um, how to use this effectively. And it's not just that we're using 20 GPUs or 20 chips. We want to fill entire buildings with them. Now, this stock photo here, you can see that they're using blue lighting to make it look all environmentally friendly and low power. But if you think about it, if you had to fill that with horses, just the amount of manure that's generated. <laughs> um, so hopefully that's given you a bit of idea of the, the true cost of power and the true impact of power. And uh, as Voltaire, or attributed to Voltaire, with great power comes great responsibilities. And you know, as engineers, we've got a responsibility to, um, to think about power as well. And I never really went through the numbers that carefully until I looked, you know, started putting these things together. I always thought, oh, it's 600 watts rather than that's a lot of horses, or that's a lot of manure, or that's a lot of heat. Um, Jason was showing me some uh, calculations he did about the uh, aggregate power that data centers use, and it's a lot. Um, so now that we've thought about power as a real thing that we can feel and touch and smell, uh, let's look at how we might be able to do a bit better in uh, implementing some of the things that take a lot of power. And we'll have a quick look at some modern FPGAs now, or some of the features of modern FPGAs, before looking at improving the algorithms that run on them. And we had a look at the GPUs before. And if you think about a modern FPGA that has a lot of floating point on it, it has 10 teraflops as well. And we can organize an FPGA, one of these FPGAs, exactly the way that, same way that we can organize a GPU. A GPU has a large number of 
simple floating point units that are very tight or can be very tightly coupled to memory. And it basically you can make it look something like this. And the FPJ, we can build the exact same thing. We, we can build anything we want. It's, uh, we've got a, quite a bit of uh, flexibility there. But we can set up 10 teraflops talking to memory very tightly coupled the same way. The one difference with the FPJ is that we have a huge cloud of reconfigurable logic that we can use to help things along when things are irregular. And this is the whole problem with a lot of the uh, algorithms we need to run now are not regular. And what you'll see here is by uh, using some of this logic for the routing to move things around a bit differently, we can actually uh, probably double our power efficiency over implementation. In fact, we've got two different ways that we can use the FPJ. We can use the standard load store structure, or we can build big um, dock products uh, using the same FPJ. And we're going to use both of these in our uh, investigation. For example, in the current FPJs, what you have is the ability to build these uh, hardware recursive structures so the dot products are supported directly in the uh, traditional struct, or what looks like the traditional uh, ESP block, using a very small amount of uh, routing to connect the ESP blocks. For example, you've got A, B, C, D added here, the output here gets fed back into this structure and uses the unused uh, adder there, and so on. So the algorithm we're going to be looking at today is QRD, it's QRD composition. If you look at the work of Dongara and all of that, look a lot at uh, what are the performance of HPC systems. The three main decompositions that are used as the benchmarking are QRD, LUD composition, and Cholesky. Uh, we're going to use QRD because this actually gives us the sexiest result, and I'll, you'll sort of see why, but because of the data access patterns. So as I said before, matrix multiplication is easy, but matrix decomposition is hard. But if you've got one of these modern luxury cars, you're going to, uh, we're going to be going towards autonomous driving. Uh, autonomous driving needs a lot of radar. Radar needs a lot of matrix decomposition. Now, the performance required by those is probably not that taxing, uh, but there's a lot of other applications where we're using a lot more uh, matrix decomposition. If we look at actual results, let's say published by Gangara, we'll see that the GPU is going to be you know, relatively inefficient for very large matrices. But what you don't see published that often is that the tail that goes as the uh, matrix gets below but in 8K by 8K, it seems to tail off quite quickly. And other, there's not a lot in the literature about this. I'd be grateful if somebody can give me some up-to-date things that still seem to be published very often. But from what we can see is that matrix decomposition for smaller matrices seems to be very, very low throughput. And it's just because we believe that's just because of the data access patterns. We can see that the, some of the results are up to 25% sustained peak but that's for a highly batched system. And if you've seen recent applications of FPJs, for example, Microsoft in a completely different application had their brainwave demo this year at Hot Chips. And they were uh, beating, or their goal was to exceed the performance of the Google TPU, which had four times the uh, performance density that the FPJ did. Uh, but they're able to do that because in a non batch system, uh, the latency of the FPJ was a real advantage. And by, if you're trying to use some of these other um, type of solutions where um, you're unable to batch, in other words, you're unable to interleave a lot of different operations at the same time, just the latencies uh, are going to cause you a problem. And again, you'll see here, even on our highly optimized implementation, there's places where the latencies will be exposed. And a lot of the things we're going to try to do now to show you how to get rid of those latencies or hide those latencies. Right, so that's probably a far too complicated explanation here, uh, getting away from our using simple pictures. We'll try to make the, get back on track with some pictures in the next few slides, and then we're going to see three slides that have a lot of um, uh, more traditional math on them. 
Now in QR, we've got a um, selection where we have a choice of several different algorithms. Gibbons probably has the best stability. Householders has very good stability and the lowest uh, number of operations. But we're going to use modified Gram Schmidt. Why? Because it's completely parallel access. In other words, we can um, parallelize this algorithm uh, very, very effectively. The other thing to look at is these number of flops, is that it isn't just the flops or the type of flops. For example, if we use elementary functions, those might just be considered as a single flop, but actually have the impact of many flops. But depending on where they are in the algorithm, those might be very, very expensive and again, stall your entire system for a while. And I'll give you an example here for Gibbons rotation. You'll see the elementary function right here, the uh, square root. Well, actually, we can implement this in inverse square root, which is a bit better than square root. But still, the square root is a very long latency operation, and it happens right at the beginning of your loop. That's a bad place to have a long latency um, uh, operator. We're not going to use Gibbons anyways. Gibbons does work quite well for sparse matrices. But you can see for dense matrices right here, uh, modified Gram Schmitz is the best because every single operation in both the inner loop and outer loop, and we'll have a look at what those look like, is in the same direction. So it doesn't matter if we're doing a inner product, a norm, a uh, scalar division, um, or any of the other operators, they're always in the same direction. So this lends itself to parallelization very well. So here's the standard modified Gram Schmitz that we'll be able to uh, see in the next book. So we're doing all right with time, so I'll like, go through this a bit. If we've got an input matrix A, we're going to have a output matrix Q and R. So basically, if we multiply Q and R together, we're going to get A and B. We have an outer loop for I equals 1 to N. So let's say we have a 256 by 256 matrix. We're going to be processing on a column by column basis. So there's 256 outer loops, and the inner loops um, start at each, so they increment by one position. So the first time you're going to go through the inner loop, 256 columns, the next time 255 columns, the next time 254 columns. So on average, you're going to go through 128 columns here. Now, the problem is when we have latency, uh, as we start try to hide it later on, especially as we get down to the end, there's going to be less and less happening in a column, uh, or there's going to be less columns in the inner loop, which means that we're going to have a harder time hiding things. But right now, if you look at the canonic implementation, uh, this works great if you have a single-threaded processor. It doesn't matter what you're doing, but if you try to parallelize things, this is really going to bog down. Now, why is it going to bog down? Because the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at a column, column A, take the whole column, we're going to take the norm of it take the norm of it, we're going to take the inner product of it, in other words, a big dot product, and then we're going to do a square root. So the dot product will have a latency, and the square root will have a latency. So a dot product might have a latency, even if you have hard floating point in this FPJ, that might have a latency of 25, maybe about the same thing for the square root. Right away, you burn 50 cycles to do one operation, and you've still got 250 columns to go. Then what we're going to do is we're going to divide this first column by the norm. We're going to normalize it. Again, the divide will have a fixed latency, let's say 20 cycles. So right away we've burned 70 cycles before we've, and we've only done the first column. All the subsequent columns, what we're going to do is we're going to take the inner product of this thing we just calculated by the next column, the actual column we're looking at, the current column. And then once we've calculated this, it's dot product mean, which will have a certain amount of latency. Then finally, we can um, process the, the, the current column by uh, subtracting the projection of the original vector from it. This is a very, very low latency. That's probably going to have a latency of about six. So if you work this out and you're, you have to wait for everything, you're going to have about a 3% sustained to peak. So this is bad, no matter how you look at it. We've got to look at a better way of implementing this or describing this if we want to parallelize this. So 
there's a couple of pages of explanation on the trickier bits here, but I'll try to explain it again uh, as simply as possible. So first of all, in our outer loop, what we want to do is we want to calculate um, the norm of the <coughs> first vector in, in the loop we're in. And then without waiting for this result, what we can do is we can take the this thing from the inner loop and move it to the outer loop. All the rest of the R's, which are going to be the, and we're going to calculate these, and you, the smart ones, or the quicker ones among you might say, hold oh, that doesn't work, and I'll explain exactly why it works on the next slide. We're just going to divide the inner loop without the, not the norm, but just the um, inner product of the first vector. We're going to divide the inner product of that first column vector by the current column vector by the inner product of this. Now this is not the same as the R we saw before, but we can use it. I'll explain that on the next slide. So the thing to remember from here, or to take away from this, even if you're not following the exact math, is by moving the R from the inner loop to the outer loop, we can all do this in a single unbroken loop. Because we don't need the norm before we can do this. We're going to use this value as the norm, but this is, we're going to issue this, the first thing we're going to issue into the pipe is the inner loop of a, uh, a sub i times a sub i. The next clock cycle we're going to issue into the pipe a sub i comma a sub j. And we can do this for all the j's in that thing. So in other words, we've just got all these things rippling through the pipe. We can worry about doing this division at the end of it. So on average, we're going to have 128 in our 256 by 256 example. We're going to have 128 um, operations in our outer loop or inner loop now. So we, we're really going to be able to hide the latency of this, um, the dot product and the division. So if there's a total latency of 50 or whatever. Most of that we're not going to see because by the time we get back to the beginning, most of that will have already been uh, processed. If I'm going too fast for you, there, remember we do have Q&A at the back, and, and even afterwards we can go to the whiteboard and just prove to you that this works. Now what we do is we've got all our, I, our sub i's. These are all single values, so we don't need to store them in a big memory. We can just have them in a uh, pipeline, just in other words, in, in a register writing out one at a time. And we can now read out our, uh, run another um, loop through. We can now run our inner loop and process each one of the following columns. In other words, these have been completely decoupled with most of the latency hidden. And we'll show what this means. It pretty well means that we get up to about a 30% sustained peak in a real world system. Now, for those of you who are paying attention, and who are good at linear algebra, what you'll notice is you say, hold it. You didn't do the norm. You're supposed to divide the um, a sub, to, to get your r's, you're supposed to divide by the norm. But you didn't divide by the norm. You divided by the inner product. You cheated. You cheated us of a square root, which has all this extra latency and power required. But if we look at the values of r and q, what well, we can see that r is actually the inner loop of a sub i times a sub j divided by the norm. And q is a sub i divided by the norm. If we multiply this out, this is actually the inner product of a sub i by itself. <coughs> so we don't actually have to calculate the norm. This actually is better for accuracy because there's going to be rounding errors introduced by both these inverse uh, square roots. <coughs> Now we don't have any inverse square roots required whatsoever. So in the real world, what this gets us is we're going to get 50% sustained to peak. Why not 100%, 50% sustained to peak, assuming no latency? Because we've got two different operators. We've got the uh, vectors, and we've got the scalars. So we look at the outer loops and inner loops. We'll go back a couple slides. This is all vector operators, so in other words, dot products, and this is a scalar operator, a multiply, subtract. We could reuse the same logic to do that, the same hardware to do that, but that doesn't work in practice. One of the reasons it doesn't work in practice 
is because if we switch from the vector to the scalar, we're going to have to wait quite a while anyways, because that vector core will have a bunch of stuff in it that needs to bubble through. Uh, plus, a lot of the hardware cannot be switched like that. So we're just going to, and still these things are going to be, the, you're still only going to run one at a time. So your efficiency there, well, just that you're able to reuse the hardware, but it's still going to run at the same uh, speed as far as the same feed goes. In the real world, because we do actually have latency, and there's latency is going to be, the pipeline is going to be exposed, especially towards the latter stages where the, you have less columns to process, your uh, through, real throughput is going to be about 30%. But this is still a lot better than 3%. But still, it's, it's only 30% as efficient as it can be. So can we get better? And to get it running better, what we have to do is figure out an algorithm where we can run both pipelines at full speed at the same time. And we can do it like this. We create another inner loop and other loop. The first part of the, is we do the first half of the, or what we do is we do the first outer loop by itself. Again, we apply the same tricks right here where we divide by the inner product of the, the first column rather than uh, finding the norm of it. And now let's look at our new outer loop. We still have to calculate Q sub i because we're and, well, we just have to we're not going to reuse that. So there's no data dependency here. We're just going to write this back in memory. But what we do here is we just start our based on what we've calculated here. We do our scalar operator. We write that back to memory, but at the same time, what we do is we write it to our vector operator, which is physically attached to the output of that. In other words, what we're doing, we're writing both back to the memory, and we'll, I'll show you this in the diagram in a minute, both to the memory and to the vector unit at the same time. So we're using the programmable routing in the FPJ to route the data into multiple different places at the same time with no overhead. So we have a zero overhead transfer, which we can't do in a standard programmable um, implementation. Our results here is that we are actually getting 100% sustained compute or close to it. I'll show you that because we're able to get both the like all the hardware working all the time. And again, we are going to see a bit of um, of the pipeline exposed, uh, but even when that pipeline gets exposed, you'll see that in normal size matrices, the matrices we really care about for radar, this is not a big problem. And what I can do here is show you the actual results. Well, this will be published in our paper at um, FPJ in the spring. And where we're going to start off with here is just look at the architecture, and then we'll look at the uh, three main um, aspects of the results. If we look right here, what you'll see is we have our tightly bound load store unit with our scalar operators, which feed are read from the RAM and write back to the RAM. The same thing as a GPU. At the same time, we can take our output and write it directly to our dot product unit. In other words, both operators are going to be active at the same time. So what you'll see here is that you're going to be writing back to memory and writing here. If we look at the actual results, you can see here for a 256 by 256 matrix, and these are actually real implementations where there will be latencies, let's say 30 in here, and there are latencies of 6 there, plus a bit of extra system latency required for the muxing in and out of the RAM. We're able to see for 256 by 256, we're now able to achieve 95% sustained compute. In other words, it, it doesn't get much better than that. Well, actually, it does when we go to 512 by 512, it's 98%. You can see it's still quite a drop off because of the pipeline being exposed for the smaller ones like 64 by 64 is 61%. But these numbers are much better than you can with, get with the programmable solution. Just because we can configure the exact um, functional units that we want, the exact sort of vector structures that we want, and we're able to get zero overhead data transfers to keep them busy at the same time. This is put into an Area 10 device, which is normally sort of a 450 megahertz device when you're using floating point, and actually does achieve this. And one of the reasons it achieves this is because all we're doing really is using the RAM and the floating point in there with very little logic. So this is another part of our um, 
what we're trying to set out to achieve at the beginning isn't just the computational efficiency, it's also turning on as little of the FPGA as possible. And these numbers here for the 128 by 128 complex one are, are good because it's very easy division. We've got about 29k ALMs and just over 1,000 DSP blocks. In other words, we've got 28 DSP blocks for the entire system, 28 DSP, sorry, 28 ALMs per DSP block. In other words, we're using virtually no soft logic to implement this. It's all mapped to hard DSP blocks, which is one of the reasons we did our power efficiency. If we look at the structure of the way the soft logic is used, you can see that most of the soft logic is used to hold a vector constant in time. Whenever it's holding a vector constant, it's consuming no power, no, no dynamic power because there's no switching taking place. The other thing is whenever it's holding one of these vectors constant, the memory bandwidth feeding that has been cut in half. So again, another way that we're using uh, power, power efficiency in our architecture and implementation. So, so these are ways that by building an accelerator that's tuned and thought about for the algorithm, you get much better uh, system power efficiency. Again, we're turning on a very little bit of the uh, FPGA to do this. So we think about this, we think, okay, well this is the future, what we're going to do, everything in the future, we're, all our new designs, we're just going to build them out of floating point DSP blocks or DSP blocks or whatever embedded operators and we don't really need any soft logic anymore. So looking around here, most of you probably uh, are too young to remember when this book came out in 92, the end of history, um, where it was uh, said that Western liberal democracy had triumphed and there are no ba really bad things were going to happen anymore. Um, so does this mean it's the end of the game for, similarly, for the lookup table? And it's funny because we are starting to Paul and Jason and Bon about this all in different aspects. Do we still need lookup tables? And do we ever need lookup tables? But lookup tables, we have to use them differently too. So this is sort of a segue into my next lecture whenever I, I come back, is if you look at <coughs> FPGAs, we, and we've had to solve this problem for completely different applications here, is if we get 80 or 90% utilization for a typical design, random design, uh, implemented by a, you know, let's say, a skilled engineer or grad student, uh, we're doing quite well. We can get maybe more, but the performance is going to drop off considerably. However, if we do a lot of arithmetic, for example, if we using real multipliers for rather than just binary returning implementations for machine learning, we've and we try to fill up the entire part with carry chains it's not going to get more than 70% full. And there's some really good reasons why using traditional design techniques is not going to get more than 70% full. So there's a problem we've had to solve, and we can get close to 100% full now. I'll explain how that works next time I'm here. But no, the thing is that the FPGA, and this going, going back to the uh, flexibility of FPGAs, sometimes we're only going to turn on the uh, DSP blocks if we can, if we can find a um, algorithmic mapping to only use the embedded features. And then sometimes we are going to try to now turn on all the logic and get all the logic working for us rather than just some of this logic being un 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 unreachable. So we've set out to do three things. One thing is I was hoping to get across the idea that power is real, and power is something we think about. Power is something you can touch, power is something you can feel, power is something you can smell, or we can have a thing that represents power. So we have to figure out a way to reduce power if we're going to fill up all these data centers with um, semiconductor devices, whatever those might be. The other thing is uh, power efficiency as far as uh, it's not the let's say dark silicon where we are unable to turn the thing on, but even where we have the ability to design the thing so we don't have to turn it all on. And the last thing is to look at uh, computational efficiency as far as making the, um, using the features and hiding things like, you know, the, um, the pipeline somehow, like hiding the latency of the pipeline somehow by restructuring the algorithms 
And hopefully for those of you who will be doing uh, linear algebra or things like this, you'll be able to think about, well, actually, there might be a better way. And if I redo the loops a bit, all of a sudden, I can get twice as much performance out of the same type of logic. So hopefully, I've managed to give you um, a taste of all three things and, and give you something to think about for the future. Thanks a lot. Questions? I have a couple, couple questions sure. that I can maybe start with. In your results there, Martin, uh, did you have power efficiency in the results? I saw sort of the efficiency there was more of the utilization of the hardware. Yeah, so we actually did measure power, but again, that's that was on the area 10 device. Yeah. So I think that's, that's in our paper or might be in our okay. paper. And there's some comparison with GPU for QR. GPU yeah, again, the, the big problem, we don't want to compare exactly because we don't have really, really good data on the exact, um, let's say, the, the exact efficiency that these things are getting as far as sustained peak. We just have sort of, a, it's almost anecdotally if you look at the GPU side. Yeah, so if anybody has some up-to-date thing of, we put a whole bunch of 256 by 256 matrix decompositions on whatever GPU and we got this performance because that would be helpful. We cannot find anything like that at all. And the second question I had is just about high-level synthesis. I presume this whole implementation here is done with custom RTL, you know, or, or meaning is is this kind of, you know, work that you've done here or these kind of transformations and the data forwarding and basically data staging, is that possible with the high-level synthesis tool? Yes. Yeah, so coming, I guess the question um, being asked by somebody who's got a high-level synthesis startup, that's a, <laughs> that, that's a very valid question. And no, I think that that's something that, okay, we, you know, as engineers, we, uh, like I said, we've got the responsibility to reduce power. And I think that if we look at high-level synthesis, it isn't just, hey, can we get the job done? But, you know, are there ways of, for example, reducing power by using things like this? And I think that's a really good for example, research or implementation area. That's something we need to do, and I've thought about that myself. I just don't have time to look at that particular aspect. Of this was custom RTL. The results. The, the original one was custom RTL. Bogdan then took it and um, let's say generalized it, where you can, you know, create, you know, you can take that same technique and expand on it. We've done similar things for that for LU, which doesn't work that well. Cholesky, which works reasonably well. Uh, like I said, uh, modified Gram Schmidt's QRD works incredibly well just because we have, we can build a thing using completely parallel accesses all the time. So it's a good sort of poster child for this type of thing. But I think that's a really, really good question to answer is when you do high level synthesis, how do you know that it's power efficient? And again, even a month ago, all I thought about was, you know, watts. Um, you know, the, it, it's almost a dimensionless number. It's something you can't touch. But a horse or a car is something you can touch. And I think that hopefully, if anybody wants to steal these slides and use that for their own work, they're, they're, they're welcome to. Yeah, questions. So, so this room is going to start next 10. Uh, how much gain, or was there any gain on the interconnect registers? Were they important to achieving the frequencies? No, we actually did this on area 10. This, we do, we do have, this is from uh, a little while ago. Bob Ogden does have some things for Stratix 10 now. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not sure if you want to say anything, or do we have no, anything? We, I mean, are we able yeah, to say I mean, anything? We, right we are reaching much higher end prices with Stratix 10. We are in the range of 600 megahertz or something. And this is about 430. So is that yeah, because of the interconnect registers or other reasons? That's a good question. No. Not sure. We've, we've not tried it without interconnect registers. So. As with anything, I'm sure you can pipeline into that, so it's worth talking about that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm going They're speechless. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, well, so thanks everybody for coming, and thank you very much, Martin, for the talk. All right. All right, thank you very much.